Nichols. Uh, my date of birth is August 26, 1943. Well, I lived, I was born in uh, 1943 at um, uh, the house on Ashes Creek and uh, by, delivered by Dr. Shields at home and lived there until uh, 1962 when I was 19 and graduated from high school. Uh, and enrolled in Glamour Girl Beauty School, or Cosmetology School, uh, at that point. Well, my uh, grandfather was Lawrence Hamilton Martin, and my grandmother was Claudia May uh, Carlisle Martin. Uh, they were my maternal grandparents. Uh, they were born in 1988, and died in he died in 1971, and she was born in 1889, and died in 1968. They had four children, Martha Edna Martin Ingram, Alvy Pearl Martin Nutgrass, Elsie Ray Martin Bentley, and William Forrest Martin. I won't go into their dates. Their grandchildren were R.L. Ingram, Mavis Ingram Bennett, Hazel Ingram Armstrong, Claudia Elaine Ingram Harton. They were children of Edna and Ernest Ingram, Ruth Searle Nutgrass Nichols, myself, um, daughter of Alvy Pearl Nutgrass and Walter Nutgrass. Uh, my paternal grandparents were Alonzo Demarie Nutgrass and Mamie Greer Nutgrass. The third grandchild uh, was J.W. Uh, Bentley, Betty Louise Bentley Schaus, Dolly Lorene Bentley Noel, David Ray Bentley, and Glenn Martin Bentley, children of Ellis Ray Bentley and Ollie Bentley. And then there was William Scotty Martin, Dorothy Sharon Martin Ingram, Karen Renee Martin, uh, children of Forrest Martin and Dorothy Bentley Martin. And they were all, um, there was many other cousins, at least 30 plus of first cousins once removed is the way I explain them. Uh, children of granddaddy's brothers, Joe and Willie Martin. So that's the basic uh, uh, lineage, I guess. Bill Carlisle uh, of the Grand Ole Opry fame uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, was my grandmother's cousin, and he grew up on Jack's Creek. And one of his well-known songs was, Too Old to Cut the Mustard Anymore. It was Ashes Creek Union Church, uh, and it was uh, made up of four uh, different um, congreg uh, congregations or denominations. Uh, but I belonged to the Baptist denomination, um, and at age 12, I was baptized in the long hole by Reverend Landon Stratton in 1955. It, it is Ashes Creek itself, um, but just up above where we lived, uh, there was like a deeper part, uh, and that's just where everybody, all the church, everybody got baptized in the long haul. Not sure why, but... <laughs> well, the building of the Man-Made Lake forced the closing of uh, Ashes Creek Union Church. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, the members were sad to see it demolished after so many years of it being their church family. Uh, the lake, though, brought growth to Spencer County, and many people have enjoyed the pleasure of boating and fishing on the lake in the years since. This is just uh, my uh, growing up on Ashes Creek. It, uh, Taylorsville is, is my hometown, hometown of my heart, where I was born and raised. We lived along side Ashes Creek where the crawdads would bite our toes as we played in the creek. Sometimes the creek would overflow its banks and flood our bottom land and across Ashes Creek Road to our yard. Uh, amazingly being born in 1943, I remember our house, Walter and Albany Nutgrass, had no electricity, no running water, had a well that we drew the water from with a rope and bucket, and no indoor plumbing. We had a two-holer outhouse. We heated the house with oil and coal, and in very early years cooked with wood-burning stove. There was a garage and a barn in that bottom land. 
we had about six head of cattle that we milked in the mornings at 4.30 and at night at 5 o'clock, sometimes squirting milk in the cat's mouth across the aisle. We had a milk stand where a milk can was used to store the milk until the milkman came to pick it up. We had a nanny goat that we milked. We had two horses named Brooke and Barney who lived to be 37 years old after tilling the land for many years. We had two dogs, a beagle named Old Bob. Old Bob was a good rabbit hunter. My daddy would go out with him to bring home a rabbit or squirrel for breakfast. The other dog was a farm dog named Rover and we would clap our hands and Rover would go bring the cows in from the field to be milked. We raised a big garden which yielded enough to can for the coming year or two. We only had to purchase flour and sugar and salt and such basics to basically live off the land. We killed hogs in October when it was well below zero and had the pork and a cow processed for our meat for the year. We also wrung many a chicken stack for some of Mama's good fried chicken. We raised tobacco and I remember weeding the tobacco beds. I also remember learning to drive the tractor when I was nine years old and could drive it when we were setting tobacco and we would sucker the plants and then field hands would cut it and hang it in the barn until it came in case and then strip it. I stripped the tips. Fast forward to present day. I have been married to Marvin Nichols for 24 years. Between us, we have four living children, 10 grandchildren and 14 great grandchildren. We are members of First Baptist Church in Taylorsville and attended there until Marvin developed health issues. But we can live stream the sermon on TV Sunday mornings from the comfort of our love seat recliner and are blessed by God's grace. It would, like I say, it, it would flood all the way up to our house. Um, but it would be more like a it does now when it's just a, a lot of water and, and then it it flows off within a few days, you know. So it wasn't a, a major flooding, but the one the bridge uh, at the very beginning of uh, uh, Ashes Creek, uh, I've seen it to the top of the railings. Uh, that that would have stayed around for a while. So, you know that yeah that would have been uh, more uh, detrimental. Uh, but where we lived, it, like I say, it just would kind of ebb and flow uh, just from being too much of a, of just a big downpour. It, at that point in time, it, was, it would just be locals because, uh, you know, after that, uh, they got so that there was a lot of uh, maybe Mexicans uh, and that type thing that would come in and, and do that type of work. But usually they just were either neighbors, friends, uh, or people, uh, you know, uh, that just, that, that's what they did. You know? So uh, it was mostly just locals. Despite the amount of plant and animal life and many narrow ridges and steep hillsides combined to make human penetration difficult and development slow, a man named Gabriel Mayfield made a petition for a mill in 1793 describing the people of Ashes Creek as living in a remote area of the country. Even in the early 20th century, many sections remained virtually inaccessible, although the road that ran along Ashes Creek was a Frankfurt Bargetown route. While automobiles could generally use this rocky main road, going back to the side roads meant switching to a horse or horse-drawn buggy, and some areas had to be accessed by a suspension bridge. Example, the footbridge I used to run across located in front of Robert Lunsford's farm. The next farm from the bend in the road was where I grew up alongside Ashes Creek. Despite these drawbacks, farmers in this and surrounding areas produced enough to establish trade with the coastal south. In the years before Spencer County was established, 50-foot rafts were built just south of Ashes Creek and loaded with produce and sorghum and floated down Salt River and on to New Orleans where the produce was sold on the open market. Kentucky established state inspection stations to oversee this early interstate commerce, and in 1799 it is recorded that one such station stood at Ashes Creek on land belonging to Gabriel Mayfield. After the Civil War, a log schoolhouse was built on the banks of Ashes Creek. Every school term, a young man or woman, sometimes just 17 or 18 years old, came to teach the children there. An 1882 map shows the school, along with a grist mill, 
blacksmith shop, and several residents. By 1900, the grist mill was apparently gone, but the blacksmith shop remained for a number of years. Mrs. Edna Ingram, my aunt, who was born in 1912 and grew up in the community, remembers those early years when there was no automobiles, no electricity, and no telephones. According to Edna's recollection, her father, Lawrence Martin, bought one of the first cars in that end of the county, and on Sunday afternoon, people from nearby farms would come to enjoy a ride along the ridge in Martin's automobile. Bob Lunsford owned the community's first radio, but even though he lived on a hilltop, the sound faded in and out. Until about 1918, no newspapers were delivered to Ashes Creek, so Lawrence Martin would walk over to Cole Ross, now Highway 1066, once a week where he would get a paper to bring home. Then, while World War I was being fought, he and his wife, Claudia, would study the movement of the troops and try to keep up with the happenings on the front. During the time when there was no store in the community, the nearest source of supplies was Wakefield, where there was also a train depot and the nearest post office. Mr. Lawrence Martin decided to begin selling groceries in a room in his house. This proved so popular with neighboring residents that he was soon able to move it into a separate building. The store carried feed and seed, a full line of groceries, and sandwiches that Mr. Martin made himself, hand cut from long rolls of bologna and lunch meat. The store remained open through the years of World War II and became the site of the community's first television where people came to watch wrestling matches and I loved Lucy when she had little Ricky. <laughs> the store closed in 1959, the year before Kentucky sales tax resumed. He said he didn't know how to figure it and keep up with all that. Several religious congregations were organized on Ashes Creek and shared a frame building called the Ashes Creek Union Church. Established in 1910, the Union Church began as a multi-denominational church with services alternating between Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, Christian, church liturgies. Um, this next article was uh, it's called Man-Made Forces, Sales of Church, and it was published by the Courage Journal and written by Bruce Bursma. In October 1976, the little creek for which this church was named flowed muddy and swollen in the cold autumn rain, lapping at its banks and tugging at the memory of Willie Martin, brother of Lawrence Martin and Joe Martin. Mr. Willie Martin, sharp and sturdy at the age of 84, came to watch Ashes Creek Union Church be auctioned off. He helped build the church 66 years prior to the auction. In less than 100 days, the little church was gone, another victim of Taylorsville Lake, a 3,050-acre project of the Army Corps of Engineers. Mr. Martin was quoted saying, we decided we better get out of here before we get covered by 40 foot of water. The church was sold to Reed Byers of Louisville for $270, and he announced he would tear down the building and use the lumber to build an outhouse and remodel the basement of his home. The auction was completed in less than two hours by H.H. H. Red Carney of Bloomfield, Kentucky, at no charge because he said, the Lord's been good to me, and I wanted to donate my talent, and I don't want no pats on the back. A total of $721 and a quarter for the building and contents was collected from the 40 people who attended the sale. The Presbyterians sold out their 25% interest to the Christian congregation, Mrs. Lucy Charles Simpson said. The Methodists left to build their own church. The Baptists organized the Wakefield Baptist Church in 1961, with Reverend Landon Stratton, and Christians remained till the end. The Christian congregation built a church in Wakefield. As reported in the Sunrise Messenger on July 12, 2016, Sunrise Children's Services became part of the legacy of a venerable old church that today lies beneath the water of Taylorsville Lake. Ms. Garnet Mobley, former member of the defunct Ashes Creek Baptist, presented Sunrise with a donation of more than $68,000 on behalf of the agency's Spring Meadows facility, a residential home for abused and neglected boys ages 12 to 18. The gift was presented in two parts, on July 12th and 13th. 
Spring Meadows is in Mount Washington. Ms. Mobley explained that the funds were originally intended to help rebuild the church, which was taken in the mid-1970s when work began on Taylorsville Lake. However, due to the lack of community interest and too few remaining former members, it was determined that rebuilding would be impractical. Mrs. Mobley, who had been named power of attorney for her uncle Tom Cull, the church's former treasurer and a generous contributor over the years, elected to donate the funds rather than see them go to the state. The last service was held on October 24, 1976 in a mostly empty church. There were six people there. Not sure if my mother, uh, Alvy Nutgrass, would have been one of them of the six, but she was the church pianist, played by ear for years. As a side note, another congregation organized in 1938 by the Assembly of God Church held their first meetings in a tobacco barn and later constructed their own building. The first pastor of the Assembly of God Church was Reverend Clarence and Orvis Strom, who moved from Montana to Kentucky. There's a picture of the uh, Ashes Creek Schoolhouse uh, is a one-room log structure covered in a weatherboard built in the mid-1800s. Joseph Lomax donated the land and became the first teacher. The school remained open until 1948. Roy Ingram's Grocery operated there until 1963, located in the bottom field as the Assembly of God Church, once pastored by Reverend Marion K. Condor and his wife Dorothy. The building was restored and sits adjacent to the Visitor Center on Taylorsville Lake. I don't recall it. I only really recall uh, two, uh, uh, Delbert Bentley was one of them, uh, was one of the ministers, and then uh, uh, Landon Stratton, who was the one that um, I, uh, you know, was saved, and uh, he, he baptized me. But I don't really ever remember the, the distinction between them. It's kind of like they just all flowed. I don't remember them being incredibly upset. I don't recall any protesting of, of the lake. Uh, but I do remember that from the time that it started being thought of in Washington, of uh, getting them money appropriate for it by uh, uh, Natcher, I believe his name was, I, it uh, kind of was uh, put aside for a long time, so I think it took about 25 years for it to come to fruition, if I recall correctly. Yeah, and um, I remember that, you know, they, they put a lot of tires uh, in, uh, I guess for the, the fish and the wildlife. Um, and then, of course, then they had to clear out a lot you know, for later boating, uh, so, you know, people would be able to uh, maneuver around. Well, our house, uh, we had sold it, uh, and the people we sold it to no longer lived there, and I think it was sitting vacant, and I, I don't know how or why it caught fire. I don't know whether somebody was just, you know, staying in it to keep warm or what, but uh, it did burn at one point. Uh, some of them were on ridges and lived on ridges. Uh, so, uh, like, but like Donovan Road uh, went up from Ashes Creek, but now if you go, uh, you have to go, I, I guess, back 1066 and around the, the back way, then you can come down to that ridge and and still see uh, like where Roy V. Ingram lived, you know, and different people uh, that lived up there. Uh, but but at that point, they, they would access it from Ashes Creek and going up Dunnevin's Hill. I don't know that I'm qualified to give advice, but I do have a few positive quotes. Uh, count your blessings and make your blessings count. Love your neighbor as you would love yourself. Be happy for every minute you are angry, you lose 60 se seconds of happiness. Stay positive, work hard, make it happen. 
and my favorite Psalms is 118.24. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. My friend, Lily Edward Shelburne, uh, wrote this poem. Uh, she's my friend uh, from Ashes Creek Church to Wakefield Elementary School to graduation from Taylorsville High School in 1962 and part of church family together at First Baptist Church, Taylorsville, to present day. <clears throat> and it's just called the Ashes Creek School. On the banks of Ashes Creek, there stood a little school. It was there for boys and girls to learn the golden rule. I never learned my lessons there. I never had the pleasure. But all the stories I've been told, I too have learned to treasure. My mom and dad attended there, and both my sisters too, and I feel honored just to share their memories with you. The teacher came at early morn by horse and buggy too. They had many chores to do to start the day of school. They built the fire, they swept the floor, they got the lessons ready. They drew the water from the well. Their hands were strong and steady. The children came from near and far to the ringing of the bell, and in each hand there could be found a little dinner pail. Through rain and snow they still would come, the weather didn't matter, and when they got there in the morn, the school would fill with chatter. They learned to read, they learned to write, they all were very chipper, and at recess time they all lined up for drinking from the dipper. They laughed, they played, they sometimes fought, but they had a lot of fun, and every little now and then to the privy they would run. The little school stands silent now. They've gone to different places. But if you close your eyes and dream, you still can see their faces. So little school, don't you be sad. For years you've been apart. But don't you know, dear little school, their memories in your heart. <laughs>